the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 1. Glory to you, Lord. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. The Gospel of the Lord. We are starting to get some questions about the tent. <laughs> the folks from the Palais de Justice were interested in just what we were doing when several of us were here Wednesday afternoon, struggling with ropes and posts and pegs. I was standing outside the gate for a while before our Ash Wednesday service, and there were more than a few long, interested looks from passerby. One of you told me that a friend already asked the question. So I saw that your church has a UNHCR tent up in its courtyard this week. What's that all about? The questions are coming, and maybe you have the same question too. <laughs> what are we doing with a refugee tent up in our front yard this Lent? An easy answer is that the worship committee is up to something. <laughs> You've probably seen them do crazier things than that before. <laughs> passing a coconut from house to house one Lent, or having everybody grow potato plants and bring them to church. So that's one way you could answer. If somebody asks you what's going on in your church's garden, our worship committee is up to something. You could also say that the tent is a reminder to pray for refugees. I think that's answer enough. Really? I understand that today there are a record number of displaced persons in the world more than we have ever known of on record. In places like Syria and South Sudan and the Central African Republic, people are fleeing violence and civil war, instability and discrimination by the millions. And really, here in Geneva, we don't hear about it all that much. So if a tent like this can be a reminder to us and to others to pray for them, then that's reason enough to put it up in my book. I think there is another way you could answer as well, though, if someone asks you what in the world your church is doing this Lent. I think you could tell them that Christianity is a wilderness faith, and we are remembering that this Lent. I know that word wilderness is a slippery one with lots of different shades of meaning. I spent some of my most formative years working at a backpacking camp in the Rocky Mountain wilderness in the US guiding groups of high school students in week-long backpacking and camping trips. I think Christianity works beautifully in that sort of wilderness, out there under skies where you can see the countless number of stars surrounded by quiet creeks and ancient trees. It works beautifully out there in creation, and I think our faith has lots to say about the immeasurable value of the created world and of our role in caring for it. God made a promise to Noah, after all, deeming the world too sacred to ever be destroyed again. So there's that kind of wilderness, and I think Christianity has lots to say about it. But that's not what we're talking about this Lent. 
We're talking about wilderness in the way that the Bible talks about it. And there, it has a pretty specific meaning. When the Bible talks about wilderness, it's talking about places where the resources for life are scarce. Where you are left without your usual supports. Where you find yourself tested just about as far as you can be. If you've been to the Middle East before, you can probably understand how wilderness ended up with that sort of connotation in the cultures that wrote the Bible. If you get outside population centers there, you often quickly find yourself in some pretty desolate and challenging landscapes. You don't have to go far from Jerusalem even today before you end up in the desert, in a place of sand and dry rock, little water, and strong, unbroken sun. The idea of wilderness in the Bible is first and foremost a part of the story of the people of Israel in the Hebrew Scriptures. Those recently freed slaves wander in the wilderness of Sinai for 40 years before they finally find their way to the Promised Land. And we'll see a little more of that story in the weeks to come. But that same idea of wilderness is also behind our Gospel reading today. The passage we heard from Mark a few moments ago. Jesus is baptized by John in the Jordan River in that familiar story where the sky opens up and a voice proclaims him beloved. It's that beautiful scene, sort of a microcosm for what we believe happens in a certain way here every time when we baptize someone. Words of grace and of love surrounding them at the font. It's a beautiful scene, but it doesn't last long. Not even as long as a baptism service. Because in Mark's terse language, the voice from the clouds has barely finished speaking when Jesus finds himself in the wilderness. And for Mark, it seems it's not just a coincidence. The Spirit enters into Jesus at his baptism, and that same Spirit immediately sends him out. Except that sends is too polite a term. Mark uses the verb drive out for what the Spirit does to Jesus. It's the same word that's used in that gospel when Jesus encounters demons. Just as Jesus drives the demons out of afflicted people, so the Spirit drives Jesus out from the comfort of his baptism and into the wilderness. It's no polite nudge that Jesus receives. He may very well not have wanted to go there, but it's where the Spirit pushed him. And that's one way I think you can talk about Christianity as a wilderness faith. Sometimes the Spirit sends us to places where we would rather not go where the resources for life can look pretty scarce. Jesus isn't the only one with that experience. Our reading from the first letter of Peter this morning is a window into a Christian community who also knew just what this looks like. While we don't know the whole story of the congregation that letter was written to, we do know they were people experiencing persecution for their faith. Surrounding communities in the Roman Empire were often hostile to Christianity very early on. And this congregation is one of many that experienced suspicion from their neighbors and from those in places of authority. We have just that tiny snippet of the letter today with language about Noah's Ark prefiguring baptism. But immediately before our reading, the writer has this to say. Even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. And do not be intimidated, but in your hearts sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. That's language that's meant to build up a community who knows firsthand what wilderness is really about. And this part too. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. So this community's experience of baptism wasn't so different from Jesus' experience. They weren't baptized into a future of sunshine and easy living, but into very real dangers. They too found themselves driven into the wilderness. And maybe you have known that experience at some point too. Maybe you have also found your faith 
sending you to places where you would rather not go, destinations you never would have chosen on your own, work you didn't think you were cut out for, situations requiring hope you didn't know was in you. And yet somehow you knew the Spirit was sending you there. Sometimes the Spirit does that. And that's one way I think we can talk about Christianity as a wilderness faith. It's not a safe, stay-at-home sort of thing. It's a way of life that will likely take you far beyond where you're comfortable, beyond what you know, where the resources for the life you've grown accustomed to may be scarce. I really believe that. But we're also on dangerous ground here. I mean, are all wilderness times the work of the Spirit? Does the Spirit drive us into the wilderness of illness or depression or grief? Does the Spirit drive refugees into the very literal wilderness in which they find themselves today? No. We just need to say that. No. This is not the work of the Spirit. The God we worship is always in the business of healing and wholeness and grace. It goes against everything we know about God to imagine God willing human misery that way. I don't believe the Spirit sends people into those sort of times, but I do believe we can say this. In Christ, God is no stranger to the wilderness. When the heavens crack at Jesus' baptism, actually tear open in Mark's language, that really means something. It means that the boundary between heaven and earth is cracked too, and nowhere can really be called God forsaken. That means the wilderness too. It may be harder to see in a bleak desert or a refugee camp or a quiet hospital room, but that's the promise. In Christ, the kingdom of God has come near to those places too. It may be harder to see, but that is our faith. And if the Spirit does send us into the wilderness, maybe we are there precisely for the benefit of others. To walk beside them for a time. To remind them that nowhere is truly God forsaken. Christian faith is like that. It's a risky faith that sometimes sends us far beyond our comfortable homes. And it's a persistent faith that tells the story time and again of a God who keeps showing up where the resources for life are scarce. So when someone asks you what's going on at your church this Lent, you can tell people we have the tent set up outside because we have a crazy worship committee. Or you can tell them something about our wilderness faith, about the God who sets up a tent in the most desolate of places, even and precisely there. Amen.